bbclearningenglish.com presents Talk About English, a series of radio features that support your English language studies. Hello. Recently in our Talk About English series, Who on Earth Are We?, Mark Beebe's looked at the differences between cultures that value the individual and those that value the group or the collective. Here's Mark to tell us about the work of someone who studied these differences. One of the first people to recognize the importance of this distinction between individualist and collectivist cultures was the Dutch researcher Geert Hofstede, the man responsible for one of the largest intercultural surveys that's ever been conducted. And it's Hofstede's work and its results that we'll be hearing about today. We begin with some background to Hofstede's research from Rebecca Fong, a teacher of intercultural communication at the University of the West of England. Hofstede used 116,000 employees in over 40 different countries from the IBM company, which is an international business company. And he conducted a survey on the differences in values and social behaviour amongst the employees. He was assuming that human behaviour isn't random, but to some extent predictable. And so that in conducting this survey, he'd be able to identify sets of responses which might reveal patterns or value dimensions within and across cultures. Rebecca Fong. The topic of our last two programmes is one of Hofstede's value dimensions, the individualism-collectivism dimension. As we said, cultures tend to fit somewhere along a scale between extreme individualism and extreme collectivism. No culture would be exactly at one end of the scale, but would tend to fall somewhere between these two poles. All Hofstede's value dimensions measure cultural tendencies in this way. And we're going to be looking briefly at three more of these value dimensions now. First, with the help of Anna Baltazar from Brazil and David Banks from Canada, Rebecca Fong outlines Geert Hofstede's power distance dimension. What the power distance dimension measures is the equality or inequality in a culture. Hofstede's research involved questioning employers and employees on decision-making behaviours. He was interested in the style of decision-making within a culture and the degree of fear amongst the employees. And what he thought he'd be able to tell by looking at these aspects was how authoritarian a culture was or how tolerant. And he'd be able to see whether the existence of hierarchy perpetuated inequalities within that culture. It seemed that high power distance cultures or cultures where there was a greater distance between the people at the top and the people at the bottom would be ones in which consultation between bosses and workers was less likely to operate and also on a purely practical level where the head of a company would experience greater status in such things as a luxurious office or having a chauffeur or privileges. I believe in Brazil this power relation is very strong. If you are the boss, probably you are going to get ten times more well paid than your first assistant or something like that. But in Brazil this power relation reflects into the politics and in culture in general. And this is a problem in a way. Hofstede discovered that the level of education in a culture was a dominant factor in deciding the power distance. So in higher power distance cultures, a higher value was put on obedience and conformity. And some of this could be seen to be because the workforce was perhaps less well-educated and more afraid of disagreeing with their bosses. The opposite of this kind of high power distance culture is the low power distance culture. And in those kinds of cultures, he expected to see more democratic systems of management and more freedom on the part of the workers to have a say in the way that decisions were made or the business was run. 
I think that Canada generally is quite an egalitarian country. If you have someone who's a new immigrant, who's perhaps doesn't have a great command of English, they will probably want to respond to their boss using the more formal family name. They would just be used to doing that. Now, it depends on the context, but generally uh, in the Canadian workplace, people are more comfortable using a first name. So the boss might say, no, it's okay, just call me by my first name. BBCLearningEnglish.com The second of Heer Hofstede's cultural value dimensions is less complicated than it sounds. The uncertainty avoidance dimension. Rebecca Fong explains with comments from Dr. George Zhang from China and Emma Kambangula from Namibia. Countries which try to avoid uncertainty are ones in which people dislike situations in which they feel that things are unstructured or they feel that the situations are unpredictable or the outcomes might be unclear. These types of cultures tend to worry about the future, for instance. Cultures which worry about uncertainty tend to adapt themselves to this by instigating measures to prevent uncertainty. Now, how do they do this? They, they form rules. So they insist on rules of social behaviour, things like punctuality, for example. And they're very precise and hard-working in order to guard against uncertainty. These kinds of people believe in experts, and very often they'll call experts in their culture by their title to reinforce the fact that these are people who know and represent certainty. In the Chinese culture, you're taught to listen to, uh, to the parents when you're young and you're going to school, listen to the teacher, and obviously when you become a member of society, and you have to listen to your local officials who were considered you know, the parent figure. You have to learn to understand individual bit doesn't make a lot of sense unless you are a member of a community. So a person or an object in his place or in his or her place is absolutely important in a way that reflects a kind of Confucian doctrine in the Chinese culture which places emphasis on people should be functioning where they're supposed to be. On the other end of the scale from the high uncertainty avoidance people are the low uncertainty avoidance people. And these are people who tolerate a lot of different types of ideas or they tolerate racial mixes. They tend to be more relaxed and laid back and unemotional in wide varieties of different situations. One thing I respect about the Namibian culture is when it comes to relationships. I found myself being friends with everyone I want to be friends with. But my friends from other African countries, one of them was very much shocked to find that I was very close to a friend who's white. Because in Namibia, I don't need to look at your tribe or the color of your skin. I have to follow my heart. My family is called the United Nations because you will find people from all walks of life. And I find that quite positive and it makes me proud to be Namibian. Emma Kambangula. The last of Gerrit Hofstede's value dimensions we'll be hearing about today is the masculinity-femininity dimension. Now you might think that this would be a way of looking at how equal men and women are in different cultures. But that's not the case. You might say it's more interesting than that. Here's Rebecca again, with assistance from Ilsa Meyer from Germany and Mahmoud Jamal from Pakistan. The masculinity-femininity dimension measures the value which a society puts on masculine or feminine characteristics. Amongst male characteristics, there's a tendency for a desire to advance to earn a lot, to do training, to remain up to date, to be competitive. Whereas for women, it's more important that there's a friendly atmosphere, that people have good relationships with each other, that there's security within the home and within work and so on. So does a culture tend to be more feminine, 
meaning does it value relationships more? Does it value security more? Or does it tend to be more masculine, on the other hand, and value more things like advancement, competition, aggression, and so on? In his findings, Hofstadter discovered that Japan and the German-speaking cultures came out high on the masculinity index. It is interesting to note that in Russia they talk of Mother Russia, whereas I grew up with the idea of Germany as the fatherland. I remember a song from imperial times which was almost like a national anthem, which ends with the words, to be the ruler of the fatherland, hail Kaiser to thee. Asian countries tended to come out in the middle or on the lower side of the masculinity index. Indian culture is feminine in many aspects. It also, of course, has a masculinity about it because it would be very wrong to stereotype it as a feminine culture. But if you look at the early poetry, early devotional songs, they are written from a woman's point of view, which is unusual because normally in Islamic culture, the lover is seen as a man. But here, the devotee or the lover is seen as a woman. And that is uniquely, I feel, Indian. I don't think there's any other culture where there's been so much love poetry written from the feminine to the masculine. Lowest of all on this masculinity index were the Nordic countries, Finland, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and also the Netherlands. And this reflects the importance that these countries have on social equality, on men and women achieving the same types of roles, on men and women sharing housework, sharing work, and so on. Rebecca Fong, bringing to an end our brief survey of Geert Hofstede's cultural value dimensions. Now, understandably, you may be asking yourself, what's all this academic research got to do with me? We'll end the programme with Rebecca's answer to that question. Next time, we'll be looking at some of the things that can make communication between people from different cultures so very difficult. Join us then. Obviously, all of this research is quite technical and academic, and we're going to be saying to ourselves, well, you know, what's this for? How is this going to affect my life? Well, it probably won't affect it very directly, but we could learn something from it in terms of where we feel our culture lies along some of these dimensions. So we might be able to use Hofstede's research to discover that our culture is fairly masculine or our culture is fairly high power distance. And what knowing these things might do for us is that when we meet people from other cultures, we could be aware of how their cultures work differently from ours. And we might be able to take this into consideration in our relationships.